The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a mysterious virus. At that point, they didn't know for sure why. Sends this father into a coma. We're like, are we going to see him again? Then his fever spikes. His breathing slows. His blood clots. I didn't even get to say my last, like, I love you. So how did he make a complete recovery? I want to hug and touch everybody. On today's 700 Club. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, as you read the story of American history, and you see how important our religious beliefs were to us, how it was the foundation of our life. Can you believe now that the motto, quote, in God we trust, is being considered extremist? That's according to a leftist group of Democrats called the Free Thought Caucus. They're determined to erase that freeze phrase from history and that's just the beginning of their all-out assault on people of faith. This will shock you. Here's Jennifer Wishon. Many Americans celebrate President Trump as the most significant champion for religious freedom in a lifetime. His actions made Christians feel secure, and now secularists, humanists, and others feel empowered to unravel Trump-era protections. It all goes back to the May 2017 executive order by President Trump. That day in the Rose Garden, the president used his pen to ensure Christians and other people of faith aren't required to check their beliefs when entering the halls of government and prevented the federal government from going after pastors who speak about political issues from a moral perspective. We will not allow people of faith to be targeted, bullied or silenced anymore. Now that order tops a long list of Trump administration actions that secular Democrats of America want President-elect Biden to erase. Represented by the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, the group paints Christians as extremists and urges the incoming administration to marginalize people of faith, relegating them to the back pew of the public square. Part of their to-do list, ensure humanist and non-theist chaplains serve in each branch of the military, refrain from using the national motto in God we trust, and reframe patriotism by avoiding phrases like God and country. In order for them to advance this new Democratic Party agenda, which is leftist, which is Marxist at its core, they have to eliminate a vibrant Christian Orthodox faith in America. It stands in their way. Democrats will also push the incoming administration to amend the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, beginning with the Do No Harm Act, introduced by then-Senator Kamala Harris last year. That act would gut the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It would make it inapplicable to cases that involve sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as abortion. These attempts to marginalize believers come as the media and even elected officials increasingly push the narrative that people of faith are unfit. Unfortunately, we see that senators are increasingly treating religious beliefs with great suspicion and even hostility. Demonstrated, Gao says, in the 2017 appeals court hearings of now Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, when some senators treated her Catholic faith as a disqualifying characteristic. The dogma lives loudly within you, and that's of concern. In Barrett's Supreme Court hearings this year, Senator Ben Sass pushed back against that statement. Because religious liberty is the fundamental 101 rule in American life, we don't have religious tests. This committee isn't in the business of deciding whether the dogma lives too loudly within someone. Nothing could be more dangerous for the future of America than to separate America from a vibrant, God-fearing faith of its people that will ensure the tranquility and peace and justice that America so desperately needs. And Perkins suggests conservatives take a page from the other side's playbook. That means using every legal option available to make efforts to roll back religious freedoms as slow and painful as possible. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Well, that Marx, who said religion is the opiate of the people, it's sort of a narcotic they can take, but it's not real. 
We live here in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and it was on these shores in 1607 that a group of people who were leaving uh, England came to these shores, and they knelt in prayer around a cross on what is called Cape Henry, which is part of Virginia Beach on the Atlantic Ocean, 1607, April 29. And they claimed this land for the Lord Jesus Christ. It belongs to him. And attempts to take it away are going to be frustrated by Almighty God because he's not going to let it happen. Well, in other news, COVID relief is on the way to help people suffering in this economy. So what does spending billions on climate change have to do with it? George Thomas explains this extraordinary bill. That's right, Pat. COVID relief legislation, as you mentioned, is headed for, the pres for President Trump's uh, desk. It provides a $300 federal boost to unemployment benefits, $600 uh, dollars in checks to individuals, and billions for small businesses. The relief was attached to a huge government spending bill, some 5,600 pages in all. While it passed overwhelmingly, some legislators protested the size of the bill and the rush to pass it without time to review. Now, some of the items included in the bill are coming out, including climate change legislation authorizing $35 billion for wind, power and clean, uh, clean power, and some $10 million for gender programs all the way in Pakistan. Huh? When we are having a financial crisis, why would we spend $10 million to tell the people of Pakistan about gender equality? Uh, doesn't that uh, just boggle the imagination? Yet that's what's going through in climate change, wind and solar and all this. And ultimately, they want to do away with fossil fuel. I was talking to an oil man yesterday, and uh, I said, they're trying to do away with oil. And uh, uh, he said, yeah, but uh, they don't have a car that can run electric across the continent. No way. And they haven't yet found an airplane that's going to fly without gasoline. And so uh, all this stuff is nonsense. Wind and solar and billions of dollars for climate change. All this having to do with COVID relief. It's just incredible how the Congress wastes your money, George. Pat, outgoing Attorney General Bill Barr is breaking with the White House as he gets ready to leave office. Monday, Barr responded to questions from the press about whether he would appoint a special prosecutor to investigate the 2020 presidential election. Here's what he said. If I thought a special counsel at this stage was the right tool uh, and was appropriate, I, <clears throat> I, would do, I would name one, but I haven't and I'm not going to asked if he would uh, appoint a special prosecutor to investigate Hunter Biden's finances. Barr said there's no need because the case is being handled, quote, responsibly and professionally. Pat? You know, we just can't sweep that under the rug. And perhaps a special counsel, I, those, those special counselors are an abomination in my opinion. But uh, do we think President... Uh, uh, Biden is going to let his son get away with all this. You know, the, the, not only is Hunter involved in terrible financial dealings, but the younger brother of Joe Biden is involved in, in a nursing home uh, disaster that he's being investigated. So you have uh, multiple investigations, and you ask yourself, is the man who says, my son is the smartest person I know, you think he's going to allow these prosecutors, usually the, the, the rule is that uh, all the counsels, all these people, the, the uh, federal prosecutors across the nation all resign uh, when a new coming, uh, incoming administration, and then they have a chance to uh, uh, appoint their own people. Uh, we've had one in New York that didn't want to resign, but he was supposed to, and he comes out strongly against Trump. But you know, that, that, that's the, the, the rule. And, you know, Biden's no different. And so he, is he going to leave in place? But at the same time, if, if Bill Barr didn't think a special uh, prosecutor is in order, uh, that, that's their call. But I, I, I just don't know about that. George? 
Pat, former Minnesota Congresswoman Michelle Bachman is set to become the new dean at the Robertson School of Government here at Regent University. Bachman is the first Republican woman from Minnesota to win election to the House of Representatives, where she served four terms from 2007 to 2015. She ran for the Republican nomination for president in the 2012 election. She is also the mother of five children and worked with private foster care agency to house 23 children in their home. Pat, she begins her service at Regent University on January 1st. I happen to be the Chancellor of Regent, and I'm just thrilled to welcome this distinguished lady as dean of a school that bears my name and my father's or somebody's name, Robertson School of Government. <laughs> Anyhow, she's going to be an outstanding dean. This is a tremendous university, and this is just one more step in bringing it to uh, international preeminence, George. Uh, Pat, we head overseas for a moment. It looks like the Jewish state is heading for its fourth national election in just two years. If the government there cannot pass a budget today, then it will collapse, forcing new elections. It seems all but inevitable after legislators voted Monday night against a bill to delay the budget deadline. Unless an agreement is reached, the Knesset automatically disperses at midnight and elections will be scheduled for March 23rd. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu blamed the Blue and White Party for withdrawing from agreements and forcing the country into what he is calling unnecessary choices during the corona crisis. Pat, if we thought we had it bad here in our nation, four elections in just two years, wow. It, it breaks your heart because Israel is our dear, dear friend, and it's the only really vibrant democracy in that whole uh, Middle East. And uh, but what will happen is when we are having this so-called interregnum here, we've got two administrations, we've got people going back and forth, and now you've got Israel without a sitting government going back and forth. Don't you think this is the time that the uh, People, Erdogan and his crew would be, and the uh, Iranians would be uh, emboldened to attack Israel. I really believe, of course, it's in the Bible, but I really believe that's coming. And the, the stage is being set. The little, it's like chess. The, the players are all being set up uh, so that this attack is going to come. And it's written in the Bible, and I think we're going to see it. And uh, it's going to be t tough on Israel, but. The Lord himself, according to the Bible, is going to defend Israel. George? Pat, back here at home. So it's Christmas season, right? And so you might think it makes sense to include a cross as part of your holiday decorations. But one North Carolina Homeowners Association mm, didn't see it that way. Mark Martin has this story of a couple who stood up for their beliefs. James Faison says after Easter earlier this year, his homeowner association said he could put up a six-foot cross during the holidays. But after he and his wife did that for Christmas, they received a letter. We were shocked. We, we really were, we were shocked, especially whenever the email had referenced that the cross was not representative of, of Christmas. And, Faison and told CBN News the North Raleigh couple was even more surprised when the homeowners association told them they had to provide biblical references connecting the cross to Christmas. As if we didn't know why we had the cross up for Christmas time. And I knew they had stepped out of, they stepped out of bounds just asking that, that question. And it, it, it just, it almost, it was an attack on our, our religious freedom. And, and so we, we just decided, hey, we're gonna keep it up. We, we, we wanna fight this. And, and, and so we kept the cross up. The HOA even threatened to find the couple. The letter of the final notice, it, it said that we will be fined $100 per day after the letter if we did not take our cross down or provide biblical references to support it. The couple provided the Bible verses. Also, a local media outlet contacted the homeowner association. CBN News also reached out to the HOA and received this statement. The community's elected board of directors has agreed to allow Mr. Faison to display his cross for the Christmas season. 
The board rescinded their letter and request to remove the cross. Mr. Faison was never fined. Mr. Faison already has a three-foot-tall cross on permanent display at the front of his home, which was never in dispute. Faison says the case has been resolved and is no longer under review. Perhaps an example of what can happen when homeowners stand up for their rights. The Community Association president says because James Faison calls the second cross a Christmas decoration, the community's policy states that holiday decorations are to be taken down two weeks after a holiday. Mark Martin, CBN News. You. Thank you, Mark. In our nation's capital, the Museum of the Bible is open for Christmas. And while things are a little different this year, as you can imagine, it is still very festive. CBN Washington reporter Jenna Browder takes us there. It's Christmas at the Museum of the Bible, and while things are a little different this year because of the pandemic, it is still incredibly festive. We were just there. Take a look. It is a warm welcome the moment you walk in with this amazing Follow the Star exhibit in the museum's Grand Hall. Intricate light sculptures, digital displays and music all come together in a beautiful retelling of the Christmas story. At the center, this giant star of David. What I'm doing is creating a new concept with the idea of harmony and peace. And backed by popular demand, renowned sculptor Tim Schmalz. His sculpture, The Nativity, just unveiled. Mary, Joseph and Jesus together in a way that, although they're distinct individual figures, they complement and harmonize together. A scene of absolute joy and love. How about a taste of international culture with this Christmas in Malta exhibit? Ten handmade nativity scenes, all crafted in Malta. A centuries-old tradition there, constructing these elaborate landscapes called cribs. Come see us. We would love for the public to come see the Museum of the Bible. Museum CEO Harry Hargrave. We've had over a million seven hundred thousand people come through here over the last three years, and of course this year has been truly abbreviated. But uh, we are open. We're open seven days a week. We were the first museum to reopen, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of people. He predicts attendance will be about 25 to 30 percent of what it normally would be this year because of the pandemic. And of course, the museum is following the government's COVID commandments. That means no large in-person events. Regular visits, though, no problem. In light of the pandemic, the museum has an exhibit dedicated to healthcare workers. We have an area about early American history where we delve into <clears throat> the work of healthcare and, of course, the, um, the biblically based organizations that have also uh, provided health care around the world. Whether it's this exhibit or any of the others, Hargrave wants the museum to be an uplifting place for visitors. We hope it to be a place of hope, a place of uh, assurance of what the truth is. We think the Bible is the truth. It's a, it's a book of encouragement. And we could all use an extra dose of that this year. And we should mention the museum also has a Christmas market, family nights, and other activities. There's more information online. Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. The place has seen over a million people. And Pat, you were uh, among one of those, right? I've been delighted to be there. I tell you, the Greens don't do anything second class. That place is absolutely fabulous. I went, I went out from there just mind boggled at, at the splendor of what they put together. Uh, it's magnificent. And uh, I don't know about the number of guests that are available to visit now, but it, it was a treat for me. And I, I just was thrilled to see it. I mean, just absolutely thrilled. And uh, this thing for Christmas is one more. It's yeah. beautiful. It's a gift to America. It is a gift really. to America, to the world. To the world. But yes. the Green family, let me tell you, they never do anything second class. I mean, it is. You say, how could you possibly do that? Well, they just write checks and they just do it. <laughs> they do it top notch. And they, they bought things that you wouldn't believe. I mean, it's just awesome. So if you ever get a chance to get up there, I, I don't know what the rules are now about COVID and all that, but uh, it, it it's a treat not only for America, but for the whole world. Absolutely. Terry, Worth the right. trip. Well, up next, they're raising kids while taking care of their parents. That's life in the COVID crisis for a huge number of millennials. So what's being done to help this new sandwich generation? And then later on, rushed to the ER, this man struggled to breathe. His family didn't know if they'd ever see him again. 
Did they miss their chance to say their last goodbye? Find out next. Working from home, teaching children at home, and caring for vulnerable parents, the COVID pandemic has upended the lives of millions of the generation known as millennials. Now, 40% of them are being what is called the new sandwich generation. So what's likely to be the long-term toll on these families? Caitlin Burke has that story. When COVID-19 first took hold in the U.S., Carla Pratico's priority immediately shifted to her parents. Both of my parents are older. I mean, I they're baby boomers. You know, my dad is wheelchair bound and my mom is his full-time caregiver. Uh, so it also was like, you know what, if something happens, like let's say, God forbid, something happens to my dad, well, I wouldn't be able to see him or go visit. That was part of it was just being available and being down to help my mom. The 60 plus group is considered high risk in a COVID-19 world, even if they're otherwise completely healthy. According to a New York Life study, that's thrusting millennials into the role of caretaker at an accelerated rate. The study finds 40% of millennials are now likely to be caring for an elderly parent, compared with 34% of Gen Xers and 13% of boomers. The interesting thing with the pandemic is that we've had many caregivers who were not in caregiving situations before, but now their loved ones are A, being very, very careful. Caregiving expert Amy Goyer says young caregivers face unique challenges. The majority of them are working, so they're juggling the caregiving with their work roles. And now with the pandemic, many are working at home. They may be raising uh, a young family, and so they are also dealing with that. Pratico would help act as full-time caretaker for her dad to give her mom a break. She found it nearly impossible to juggle work with his care. After six months, other family members stepped in to help, and the Praticos decided to go back home to New York City. Still, research shows a majority of millennials predict they will continue providing financial, housing, or caregiving support even after the pandemic ends, a factor that could take a long-term toll. 28-year-old Theron Robinson has been a caregiver for more than 20 years. Doctors diagnosed his mother with a terminal autoimmune disease when he was just in middle school. Incredibly driven, Robinson worked to juggle a career with his caregiving responsibilities. Then, the pandemic changed the game. Suddenly, keeping his mom safe meant staying home. Going online is a blessing for Robinson and many other millennials. Technology is just amazing. For example, on Facebook, you know, I follow three different groups for caregivers, and I follow three different groups for her uh, autoimmune diseases. So those people are a huge support because I get so much advice from those people who've been caregivers 30, 20, 15, five years. The trend of millennials stepping in to help aging family members is only expected to grow. Experts say it's imperative for this generation to begin factoring that into their financial plans, as this pandemic has already highlighted how important it is to prepare for the unexpected. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Incredible. Boy, what a strain. You're trying to work. Maybe you've got your own children. Now you've got an aging parent you've got to look after. I mean, you talk about stressed out. Boy, do they ever need prayer. Well, anyhow, we're going to be having some wonderful things for you coming up. A miraculous healing, and I'm glad to see them. Terry. Absolutely. Still, I had a turn for the worse. This man had been on a ventilator for a week when his body started crashing again. So how did he make it out of the hospital alive? Find out, that's next. Chills, severe stomach pains, and gasping for breath. Robert Calloway was rushed to the ER by his wife and daughter. And before long, Robert's heart rate spiked, the fever spiked, 
His oxygen levels took a nosedive. Within days, he was on his deathbed. Doctors said, shook their head, told the family it's too late to save him. So how on earth did Robert survive? Hey, a Christmas miracle. You'll find that. As a high school and college referee and umpire, Robert Calloway was very active and rarely got sick. Then in March 2020, he developed chills and stomach pains so severe, his wife Barbara had to take him to the ER. COVID-19 had yet to take hold in the U.S., so when doctors couldn't find anything wrong, they sent him home. I thought, well, he's got a virus, you know, he'll get over it, just needs a few days. Then four days later, Robert was having trouble breathing. So his wife and daughter, Gabby, rushed him to the ER again. This time, he was admitted to the hospital immediately, suspected of having COVID-19. I didn't even get to say anything to him. And it was kind of, um, it was kind of heart wrenching after that, just because I was like, I didn't even get to say my last, like, I love you. It was horrible. It, sending him back there and not knowing you know, at that point, we're like, are we going to see him again? Robert was given oxygen and put in isolation. Within days, his breathing was so poor, he had to be put on a ventilator and into a medically induced coma. The same day we actually got the COVID results back um, to say that he was positive, the doctor called me and said, his breathing has gotten worse and we're going to need to put him on a ventilator. It made us very nervous. It was just kind of like, why? You know, why him? And so... That was a little discouraging when he did go on the ventilator. In the condition he was in, um, I, I really was, I was very concerned. I, I came home and cried. Unable to stay with Robert in the hospital, the family dealt with it the only way they knew how. As we were praying and friends were praying, they just kept encouraging me. And I think that increased my hope um, for the situation. The church family would bring us stuff, our neighbors, would drop stuff off and, and we just we were just here for each other. Then after one week on the ventilator, Robert took another turn for the worse. His heart rate and fever shot up and his oxygen levels plummeted. At that point, they didn't know for sure why. It was, it, it was pretty scary. I would just talk to God and, and at one point I did have to say, God, you know, if, if this is his time, then, you know, at least I know he's, he's gonna be with you. You know, I was confident in that. One of Robert's doctors told Barbara a CAT scan revealed he had blood clots, several in his legs and one in his lungs. They put Robert on blood thinners, but made no promises. She said it does not look good. She said that there's some things that a bigger hospital could be doing for him. But she said, honestly, at the point where he's at, he might be too late for that. Barbara sent out another urgent request for people to pray. Then over the next two days, Robert's numbers started returning to normal. Soon doctors were able to take him off the ventilator and bring him out of the coma. We knew that he still wasn't out of the woods yet, but um, it was just very joyful just to have him awake and, and breathing on his own. So that was awesome. They said, you know, it's going to be a long road for recovery, but we're pretty confident that he is going to recover. You know, you could definitely see the prayer. The prayer for healing was working. As the prayers continued, Robert was well enough to be released from the hospital to go to a rehab facility. It had been 41 days since he arrived. Just to see all of the, the hospital support that he had and then the friends and family that came out, just to see him, it was just, it was awesome. And it was just like a miracle. <laughs> um, and I could just see the joy on his face to be leaving the hospital. I was just overjoyed with, with elations of these many people have saved me. It showed the power of prayer and love. Then on May 12, Robert went home. It was great to bring him home. It was really surreal. I didn't even want to leave his side at that point. <laughs> I wanted to hug and touch everybody. Today, Robert is back to his active life and enjoying time with his family. The blood clots have disappeared, and he has no lingering issues from COVID-19. I know that so many people you know, stood and, and prayed for him and for our family. And I, it's definitely given me a different outlook on life. Sometimes 
you, you might not see an instant gratification or an, you know, an instant answer, but if you wait and you stay in the Lord's, uh, in, in, in the Bible and in His Word, that you, you know, He's faithful. He's faithful no matter what. Have faith, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and you too will beat more than just the COVID. You'll beat anything else that's coming. No matter what the circumstance looks like and no matter how um, bad things get or how bad they look, that it's nothing is too far gone for God to redeem. Nothing is you know, too broken for God to fix. And so continue to pray, continue to have faith um, and trust in His plan and in His timing and not in our own. I like that nothing's too broken for God to fix. Nothing's too, isn't that great? That, 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 that girl's got it. Here, here, you know, we, we sent these little things out where you, you hung them on the tree, you punched this one thing out, you filled it out and sent it to us, you hung the other one on your tree as an ornament, it looks real pretty. And uh, these are the prayer requests that have come, they're just some of many. Somebody's got Alzheimer's and they ask for prayer. Somebody's got family relations, they're, they're troubled. Somebody has Crohn's and somebody said, I need to sell my house. Mm. house. What do you have? Well, someone asking for relief of mental confusion mm. and torment. My wound to finally heal. My knees to be healed. No more walker. God to send a mighty spirit of revival worldwide. Amen. We're all praying that. Well, folks, with God, all things are possible. I, I keep saying it over and over again. Jesus said, with man, it's impossible. Was the doctors on Robert said, look, it's all over. We can't do anything for him. But God did a miracle. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. So right now, Terry and I are going to join hands together, and we're going to believe God for you. Mm -hmm. As we get closer and closer to Christmas, this is the time where God wants to do a miracle for you. So all I'm asking is you to receive it. If you'll agree with us, and we'll agree with you, and we agree with the Holy Spirit, we'll agree together. Father, we join hands together, and we thank you. We thank you for the miracle of sending your Son on Christmas, that you sent the Son of God, and angels proclaimed the birth of a Savior. He's Jesus Christ, the Savior is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, Lord, we come in your name, not in our holiness, but in your holiness, not in our righteousness, but your righteousness, not in our power, but in yours. And in God, there's nothing impossible. There's a lung disorder. You are coughing up blood and uh, I don't know if it's, 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 it's partly in your stomach, but there's something actually in your lungs itself. You're having a hard time breathing. In the name of Jesus, touch them. Terry. Now, there's someone named Joyce. You're praying for someone in your family. You've been praying for years for their salvation. They are coming home to the heart of God this Christmas. So begin to thank the Lord for that. Stand on His promise. Begin to thank Him before you see it. Uh, there's a Bernice. You have pulled your quadricep muscle and it really hurts. So just put your hand down there on that part of your anatomy. In the name of Jesus, you'll feel heat going through your body and you are totally healed. Terry? Yeah, there's someone named Alexander also. You've been a person of faith, but lately your faith has been waning. God is going to just reignite that in your heart, Alexander. Just begin to worship and praise Him. Get back in the Word. Stand on the faith that has been so strong for you over the years. Uh, Marcia, I, do, I believe you were doing tumbling, and in the process of tumbling, you, you, you either fractured your neck or you hurt your spine somewhere along the way of your neck and God just heals you. You'll feel the power of God going through you right now. In Jesus' name, Terry, one more. Yeah, well, while we're all praying together, Lord, we just ask you for revival for yes, this God. nation, but worldwide, a Thank mighty you. outpouring of your spirit, Let like a blanket Lord. of faith, God, that would begin to cover the hearts and minds of people Thank everywhere. You, in Jesus' name. And Lord, for all these who ask for prayer, may the power of God touch them. And people in this audience, may they receive the glory of God. Lord, let them see the glory of God this day in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. And amen. Mm. Listen, give us a call. We love to hear from you. We want to hear as the Lord has healed you and touched you. Please call. We love to share those stories. If you need prayer, there's somebody here. We've got folks on the phone all the time. Holidays, weekends, Sundays, Saturdays, whatever. People here just who love you, okay? It's 1-800-700-7000. It's easy to remember, okay, Terry? Well, still ahead, no paycheck and no way to save for retirement. So how did making a $5,000 gift lead to a $50,000 deal? And then later, we have your questions and Pat's got some honest answers for you. Tanasia writes, does God have the gift of single life for some and the gift of marriage for others? What will Pat say to that? You'll find out when we return. On Christmas Day in 1863, the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow listened to the bells from a nearby church, overwhelmed by loss. Two years earlier, his wife had burned to death in a fire, and he had also been badly burned trying to save her. At times, his grief was so great that he feared that he would be sent to an asylum. His son had also been wounded in the Civil War and was temporarily paralyzed. As he listened to the church bells, Longfellow wrote a poem that reflected his grief. In despair, he wrote, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. But he ended the poem, which was later put to music on a note of triumph. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, good will to men. Welcome back, folks, to the 700 Club for the CBN News Newsbreak. A rare celestial event last night. The two biggest planets, Jupiter and Saturn, aligned in the night sky. They appeared closer than they have in centuries. The pair look like a double planet. Astrom astronomers call it the Great Conjunction. This phenomenon has been compared to the Christmas star, in reference uh, the light that guided the three wise men to Jesus. The next time this will happen will be in 2080. Here's a great story. Hundreds of drivers got free gas as a Christmas gift from a church. The Greater Emmanuel Family Worship Center Church in Houston, Texas, sponsored the gas giveaway. People got $25 worth of gas at an Exxon station. The pastor and his wife told the local news there they wanted to share their blessings and give hope to people around the holidays. The church gave out a total of $10,000 worth of free gas. They estimate that it will help fill up some 400 cars. So awesome, guys. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, Charles and Julianne Fay were living the high life. They dined in expensive restaurants and traveled the world. Then Charles decided to go into business for himself. So what happened next? Soon the couple could only afford to split a sandwich. When Charles and Julianne Fay married, they were both successful in their careers. Julianne was a sought after fashion model and Charles had more than 30 years of experience as a corporate executive in sales and engineering. God has blessed me. I've been all over the world. I've met all kinds of people. I've been involved in all kinds of businesses. But Charles had very different views of money and giving than Julianne did. Well, I was more about saving than giving. I was focused on retirement. I was a conservative spender. Julianne had been a longtime supporter of CBN. 
She continued giving to CBN after they married and says she had good reason why. She'd almost died from an undiagnosed health condition. At 33, I suffered a brain aneurysm. So I knew I was dying. I, I called CBN for prayer. And the surgeon that finally got me after a week of misdiagnosis told everyone that I had a better chance of winning the lottery than living. I actually did the cover of a magazine three weeks later. Early in their marriage, when Charles' contract ended as an acquisition and merger advisor, it led to a huge shift in their lives. Now back at home, Charles decided to start his own consulting company in investment banking. It's 100% commission, and you get paid at closing. Sometimes it takes a long time to sell a business. I'm suddenly faced with no paycheck coming in, insufficient money for retirement. There's a lot of concerns and fears. It was scary. We were in retirement age. If anything went down or dipped, our future savings would be in severe trouble. With no set income and little money coming in, they cut back on their spending. Here's a couple that was used to dining out in the finest restaurants, traveling the world, and going to sharing sandwiches, a real financial awakening. During this time, Charles and Julianne had Bible studies together. One day, Charles asked her what tithing was. Then I didn't know how to pronounce it. I called it tithing, and she laughed. I told him tithing was bringing 10% to the storehouse. It's God's money. So now when my stress level's here, I'm looking at tithing as the absolute impossible request and timing. But actually, it was the best time. Even though they weren't making a lot of money, they still made the decision to tithe to CBN. We didn't really have a church home, so we started tithing to CBN. I like the way they help people, like building wells. Our money's not going to handouts, it's hand up. They're bringing quality to life, starting with salvation. And they also help out here at home, uh, military families that are struggling. Then in 2014, they gave CBN a check for $5,000. Within a couple of months of making the gift, Charles closed on a $50,000 consulting deal for his firm. God rewarded us tenfold, just like he said he would. <laughs> and Julianne's modeling career really took off. My income doubled. I did so many infomercials. It was unbelievable how money was coming in, and at the right time. Today, Charles works as a merger and acquisition advisor for an investment banking company. And Julianne's modeling career isn't slowing down. They say they're in a great position to retire soon. They believe the reason they are so blessed is because they are givers. All the money that we have is really the Lord's money. He's just giving it to us temporarily. So why would we not give him back the 10% that he's asking for? When you give to the Lord, whether it be faith, money, your hopes, your prayers, it comes back so strong, you can't contain it. It's all about trusting God, really, isn't it? Charles said, you know, God's going to take care of you just like he said he would. And he will. He wants to. It's his good pleasure to do that. And it's good, his good pleasure to bless us so we can bless others. So I want to invite you to be a part of what Charles and Julianne are doing. Join the 700 Club, because when you do, you're impacting people in need around the world as well as here at home. I can't think of an easier way to make that kind of an impact than to join the club. It's 60 Five cents a day, $20 a month. You'll be joining with thousands of others who've decided to do that, and you'll be helping us expand the work that we're doing as well. So call our toll free number. It's 1 800 700 7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. By the way, when you call, will you say you want to do it using Pledge Express? That's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. It's pretty wonderful. You don't have to have envelopes or stamps or remember anything. It helps us save some administrative costs, so even more of your gift goes right into the place of need in the lives of people. Our way of saying thank you for using Pledge Express is to send you Power for Life teachings. You'll get one of these every month. I think they'll be a blessing to you, and you'll have the privilege of knowing that you are blessing others on a very large scale. So thank you in a advance. Amen. Well, amen. still ahead, Pat's going to give his uncensored take on life's toughest questions. Denise says, if Christians are saved from sin and death, why do Christians die? Another round of your questions and honest answers is right around the corner, so don't go away.
the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, composer Noel Regney battled depression and flashbacks from his time in World War II. As he walked down the street in New York, he watched mothers pushing babies in strollers and thought about the one moment in time when he felt that God had given men a chance for true peace. Regney then wrote some lyrics and gave them to his wife, Gloria, who wrote the music. The song was recorded a month later and released just before Christmas. The command for people everywhere to pray for peace resonated with Cold War audiences. And newspapers reported that drivers who heard it for the first time on the radio were so struck by the words that they pulled their cars off the road to listen. Do You Hear What I Hear was an instant hit, selling 25 million copies during the holiday season. Well, we always love hearing from all of you, knowing what's on your heart, what's on your mind. And so we're going to start our question and answer segment, all right, Pat. Let's, let's go at it. This is Tanasia, who says, Hi, Pat. I'm 21 years old, and I've never been in a romantic relationship. No matter how much I like the idea of God blessing me with the husband, it seems like that's not the path he has laid out for me, which I'm fine with, because that means more attention for God. But I am told that I'm not meant to stay single for the rest of my life. So my question is, does God have the gift of a single life for some and the gift of marriage for others? Oh, there's no, no question about it. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus said so some people uh, were, were kind of like made eunuchs by men, and others, they, they just have a desire to, to live for the Lord. And the Apostle Paul said, look, if you're married, you're going to be concerned about the things of your wife and uh, your husband, your spouse. Or if you're single, you can be concerned about the things of the Lord. So uh, Paul himself was single, you know, and he, he said, have I not got the same privilege that Peter and the other guys have to take a, a, a Christian wife with me? So marriage is wonderful, and if you want to stay single, and God's given you that gift, but it is a gift of God. There's no question about it. It isn't something that just happens naturally. Uh, it's a gift from God to, to I mean, I, I am very happily married, and now we just celebrated, I think, my 18th great-grandchild. So I, I, I like having a big family, so, but some people like it being single. Okay. This is Denise who says, if Christians are saved from sin and death, why do Christians die? Well, uh, you're saved from the uh, ultimate death, which is separation from God, but you're uh, we are mortal, M-O-R-T-A-L, which means subject to death. God is immortal. He doesn't die. But we all die. Everybody will die, um, except those who are uh, alive when the Lord comes back, and then we'll be instantly transformed. But other than that, we all die. All, all flesh, we all die. And then our spirits live on, but our bodies die. So your spirit doesn't die, but your, your body will. Right. Okay, this is Susan who says, my stepson has been bleeding us for money for years. We have given him tens of thousands of dollars with no payback from him, even when we need it. The last time we asked, he just told us how old and stupid we were. We are just so ready to break all contact with him, but are conflicted on what the Bible tells us to do. Is it right to pray for a family member, but walk away from them? It's, it's not son, it's son-in-law. No, it's their son. Their son? Her stepson. Her stepson. So probably son. from a previous marriage. Stepson. I wouldn't give him a dime. <laughs> you know, the Bible makes it real clear. If any man shall not work, don't let him eat. I mean, he, 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 you, can, you can't have a freeloader running around and insulting you. Yeah. I mean, who needs that? I mean, you can love him, pray for him, but at the same time say, look, that's it. The checkbook just got closed. You can make it on your own. If you don't make it, starve. And, you know, I mean, that, they, you know. You might want to phrase that. Well, the, the, Bi the Bible makes it very clear. A, a man's appetite <laughs> drives him to work. But yeah. this guy's a freeloader. You don't need that. I mean, and it's nothing uh, in the Bible that says you have to continue to pick up the tab for a grown child. You don't have to do it. Yes. This is Maria Pat who says, how can you feel God's presence on you? My son watches the 700 Club with me sometimes and wanted me to ask you. Well, uh, this is not something you work up. It's something the Lord gives. And 
I, I think the, the, you know, the idea is you empty yourself mm -hmm. and God fills up what's empty. And you come before the Lord and empty yourself of all your striving and, and yearnings and all this. And you say, I only want you. And when you get empty, God will fill up an empty vessel. All right. And that keeps, that focuses. That focuses you. Yeah, all right. One, one more question. Okay. Well, this person says, hi, Pat. Why do you go to hell for all of eternity if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Uh, you, you don't go to hell because you don't accept Jesus. You go to hell because you've sinned against the Holy God and you've broken his commandments and you have offended him. And after death, you'll pay the price. Uh, it's those who have accepted the Lord will receive mercy. You don't go to hell because you don't believe in Jesus. You go to hell because of your sin and your rebellion against God Almighty. And hell is awful, but there's forgiveness for those who come to Jesus Christ. Well, today's power message comes from 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For all of us, this is Pat Robertson. See you tomorrow.